Well, when I left him in March on that day in 1980, I scarcely knew whether I would see him again. I hardly thought that it was possible unless I made haste. But the truth is, as a number of you well know, that not only did we see him again, but we saw him in the pulpit again. In May of 1980, he preached in Glasgow. I could hardly believe that it would be possible, but he was there. And those who were in that service in Glasgow will not forget it. He preached for an hour from the second psalm and finished with tremendous earnestness and passion on the words, kiss the son lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. That sermon is on tape. And after that sermon, he did something that I had never seen him do before. He literally, at the end, he had to sink and sit on the pulpit steps, white, silent, exhausted. It was an amazing fact that he was there. And I believe he had gone for any reason, perhaps this above others, to help and encourage the many younger ministers who were there, men who will speak of it many years hence. And now here is Dr. Lloyd-Jones preaching that remarkable sermon from 1980. Psalm 2, and I'm going to read it to you. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and he perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Now it may well be that there are some here tonight who wonder what that has got to do with our present world situation. Well, I'm going to show you what it does mean and how relevant it is. This is, of course, a well-known and a remarkable psalm. Undoubtedly, it was first of all written and meant to apply to the age in which King David himself lived. He was dealing with his own contemporary situation primarily. but. As you probably all realize and remember, this psalm goes beyond that. It's one of those prophetic messianic psalms. I asked my friend, the Reverend Alexander, to read that portion from the fourth chapter of the book of Acts in order that you may see how it was regarded as a prophecy of what happened eventually in the coming of the Son of God into this world. And you remember how there the early church faced with not only persecution but with possible extermination. In their prayer to God they quoted this second psalm showing how relevant it was to their position. How they were in a position that was verifying this and they used it in their plea to God 
to come amongst them and to grant them deliverance. And as you remember, God did so. So it is a psalm that is always relevant. This is one of the great things about the Bible. It's the most contemporary book in the world. It's never out of date. It always speaks to the precise position in which we find ourselves. And I want to show you how it seems to me to give us in this short space uh, precisely the task that is confronting every one of us at the present time who are at all concerned about the grievous state of affairs in this world at this present moment. Now, the first thing, of course, we have to realize is this. We've got to realize what the early church realized, that in and of ourselves, we really can do nothing. We must do what they did. They, you remember, began to pray. They lifted up their hearts to God with one accord, and they put themselves in his hands and pleaded with him to intervene. And he did intervene. He sent his spirit upon them. He poured out his spirit upon them. And in such a measure that the very building was shaken. Now these men, you know, were many of them on whom the spirit had come in great power previously. On the day of Pentecost. But he kept on coming. And if you were one of those who believe that the Holy Spirit has come once and forever on the day of Pentecost, and that we shouldn't plead with God to send him again and out, and in an outpouring of the Spirit in great profusion, well, then our situation is entirely hopeless. Every revival is but a repetition, in a sense, of what happened on the day of Pentecost. And what happened there as the church was gathered together in that room, as described in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. And my dear friends, whatever else I may say or may not say tonight, I hope you will go home with this in your mind and in your heart. Pray to God without ceasing to make bare his arm, to pour out his spirit upon us again, until not only buildings are shaken, until we are shaken and we are given the power to preach this word in a manner that shall be irresistible. Well, that's absolutely basic. And then, having had this power, we must be clear as to what we are to present to the people. And now I'm going to show you how this second psalm, in a most extraordinary manner, seems to me to describe our exact position tonight. It starts off with these words. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying. Now, this is put in our Bibles in the form of a question. And in a sense, it is a question. But I think that even beyond being a question, it is an expression of astonishment, an expression of horror. Why do the people rage? Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine? A vain thing. What's the matter? Why are things as they are? And you and I have got to start with this question. Are you amazed? Are you astonished that our world is as it is tonight? This is our starting point. And then we come on, you see, to a description of the state of the world. And here it is. The heathen rage and the people imagine, that's the Jews, a vain thing. Now what does this mean? 
Well, here I'm going to show you how apt and how perfect a description it is of conditions at this present time. The people, the heathen, the world is raging. What does this mean? Well, the authorities are agreed that it's a comparison, that it's a reference to a condition which is like the roaring and the raging of the sea. Now, mankind in unbelief and apart from God is often referred to in the Bible as being like the sea. And it is like the sea. But you know the sea is something that varies considerably. And the same has been true of the history of the human race. You all know what it is on a fine summer's day to go down to the seashore and you look out at the sea and you would imagine at first sight that it was absolutely motionless. It seems quite smooth, it's calm, we say it's like a mill pond. And there doesn't seem to be any movement at all in it. But there is, of course, the sea is always restless. It's always moving. There is always ebb and flow. It's never really at rest. But then there are other times when you go down to the same seashore and you're looking out at a most terrible storm. The billows are raging and hurling. The wind is lashing them up. The whole sea is in a state of violent turmoil. Now, that, it seems to me, is a parable of what has been true of the human race over its long recorded history. There have been times in the history of mankind when everything seemed to be calm and quiet and peaceful. And mankind was settling down and living at its ease and enjoying itself. We read in our history books about the Pax Romana. The great Roman Empire was able to keep the then known world in a state of quiet and of peace. It was like the sea in the summer. Of course, there was always the movement, there was always sin, there were always problems and troubles, but it was comparatively calm and comparatively quiet. And there have been other periods in the history of the world when things have been like that. It was like that, you know, speaking generally, during the last century, the time of the so-called Pax Britannica. After the Napoleonic War, there was this long period of quiet and of calm. There was the Crimean War, but it was a very minor affair and it seemed a long way off and it created very little disturbance. But it was the era of the Pax Britannica. And most people in this country thought that we'd arrived at a position when there'd be no more war, no more trouble, Everything was so quiet and so calm and so placid. Of course, there was still the movement. There were the moral problems. There was sin. There were all kinds of disturbances. But looking generally at the history of the world, it was a time of peace and of calm. And it continued like that until 1914. I remember very well the years up to 1914. And men really believed that we'd banished war that we'd never again have a great war. But, you see, it came. And by tonight, you and I are in a world in which the heathen are raging. We're living in the midst of a storm. We're in a hurricane. We're in an age of violence. There's no longer any placidity. I needn't keep you with this. You're all aware of it. We're in a violent world. 
People have always sinned. Man sins by nature. But he's not always violent. He's not always raging. Last century when men sinned, they were a bit ashamed of it. They tried to do it under the cover of night. They didn't want their parents to see it. They didn't want the minister to see it. That's no longer the case. Men and women are sinning openly, violently, bursting about it. We're not simply in an age when men and women drink. We're in an age of alcoholism. We're in an age of drug addiction. We're in an age of theft and robbery. We're living in an age when it's no longer safe for people, young as well as old, to walk the streets at night. You've read in your papers of Sir Alex Hume and others being molested and attacked and thugged even in underground stations in London and on streets in Chelsea. This is the age, my friends, in which we are living. It's an age of violence. It's an age of raging. It's an age in which men and women are breaking every rule and every law. And the whole world is in a state of confusion. We've had during this last weekend this phenomenon in London in connection with that embassy of the Iranians. And this is happening in other parts of the world. I'm even weary with this. It's an age of war and rumors of wars, of tumult and of strife. And who knows what's going to happen? Things seem to be going from bad to worse. It is a time indeed in which people are sinning with cart ropes, as an Old Testament phrase puts it. And we're in this violent situation of raging. That's the first thing that we've got to realize. It's no use our thinking. I'm speaking to evangelical people. You and I, you know, tend to live sheltered lives. And many of us don't know what's happening in the world in which we are living. We are not to become little ghettos. We are living in the world and we are to know its condition. We are to be aware of what is happening. The breakdown of the home, breakdown of marriage, breakdown of all the sanctities, desecration of the Sabbath and of everything that is holy. That's the world in which we are living. But then we come to the second half of his description of the state of affairs. The people imagine a vain thing. Now, what does this mean? Well, we've looked at the world and we are reminded of a word that is written by the prophet Isaiah. He said, the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. And our world tonight is filled with mire and dirt, pollution, corruption, violence and decay. And in the midst of this, what are the authorities doing? And remember, they are the kings and the rulers. This doesn't merely apply to the common people. The kings and the rulers, all the great people, the philosophers, the politicians, the educationalists, the scientists, they're all involved in it. And what are they doing? They're imagining vain things. What does this mean? Well, I like very much a translation which puts it like this, that they are devising futile and empty schemes with a world which is raging and violent and full of mire and dirt. They are devising futile and empty schemes. Isn't that a perfect description of our world tonight? Here they are, bringing in new bills in Parliament to try to control the situation. And they've been doing it for years. This is the whole story of civilization. Man has been attempting to control this evil, this raging, this sin, 
that is so rampant and they have put great energy into it and they are still doing so. There are still people who believe in, pol in politics and that politics can put this world right. They still have their conferences, they've never had so many and there are those who are trying to persuade us evangelicals at the present time that we must pay more attention to politics and social affairs if we want really to influence men and women. But that's exactly what the people have been doing all along, these empty and futile schemes. I mustn't weary you with them. We're all so familiar with them. How men have put their faith in education, in culture, in knowledge, in traveling. After the First World War, they brought in what was called the League of Nations. This was going to banish war. The distinguished statesman had spoken during the war and had said this was the war to end war. And President Wilson introduced the idea of a League of Nations. We were going to banish war. And people believed that. This was the scheme. But of course the Second War came. What then? Well, United Nations Organization. And you read in your papers constantly of people traveling about by jet planes from conference to conference, Congress to Congress. They're going to put the world in order. They put their faith in these vain and empty schemes. Education, yes, further education. Spend more money on it. Give the people knowledge. These are the things which people have devised, but I think that by now we all are beginning to see that these things are nothing but futile and empty schemes. I was reading the other day a statement by a well-known Russian writer of the last century in which he said that history is nothing but the autobiography of a madman. I read another man who said recently that the state of the world tonight is organized insanity. It is organized. We've never been so highly organized. But it's organized insanity. An old German writing 300 years ago of the name of Neander, he said these, he wrote these words, pride of man and earthly glory, sword and crown betray its trust. What with care and toil he buildeth, tower and temple fall to dust. And that's the position in which we find ourselves tonight. Now this is not merely the opinion of a little preacher like myself. You read what some of the ablest men in the world are saying. They're not Christians. Some of the scientists are the most pessimistic men in the world tonight. They are saying one after another that we're on the edge of an abyss, that we may be sliding rapidly into a final chaos. They're losing hope. Why? Well, because everything has been tried. The utopias of which men have written since the time of the ancient Greek philosophers, coming down the centuries, men have always believed either that the world is advancing automatically to an ideal state, or that by means of our efforts we can produce this. But here we are in our much boasted and vaunted 20th century, finding ourselves in a collapsing world. Civilization is failing. All the things and the schemes in which we put our faith, are failing before our very eyes. Well now then, that's the world in which we are operating. This society, every church, every Christian. What are we to do, you say? Are you merely here to describe the state of affairs and to send us home depressed? Not at all. I'm calling attention to this song because it gives us the only explanation as to why things are as they are. That's the question. Why do the heathen rage? Why are the princes and the kings and the great men trusting still to their vain and futile schemes? 
Why is this? And unless you and I have the explanation of it, we'll have no solution for it. You have to diagnose before you treat. I was reading the other day about some old farmer in Australia, and he said something that I liked very much. He'd bought some new machinery, and of course the machinery had arrived, and with it the instructions as to how it was to be used. But he, and especially his sons and the farm workers, they thought they knew all about it, and they didn't bother with the instructions. They could handle the machinery. But after a while, something went wrong with the machinery, and they were able to put it right, and they went on. But the machinery broke down again, and they were able to put it right again. But then the machinery broke down, and they were unable to do anything at all about it. And they didn't know what to do. They were at their wit's ends. And then the old man, the father, uttered a word of wisdom. He said, what about reading the instructions? And they read the instructions, and they discovered immediately what had gone wrong and what could be done about it. And what you and I have got to do in the first instance in our modern world is to tell men and women to come back and read the instructions. The philosophers don't know what's the matter with the world. The scientists don't know. You and I who believe the Bible are the only people who know and who can know. Why? Well, because we've got the instructions from the Maker. And until we come back to the instructions, there is no hope whatsoever. So what do the instructions tell us? Well, they start by telling us the cause of our troubles. Why are we on the edge of this abyss? Why are we facing the breakdown of morals and all the things that are of greatest and of final value? And here we are given the answer. It is all due to man's sin. But we've got to be clear as to what sin means. There are some very slight and superficial ideas with regard to sin today. Some people don't even like the idea at all. They just think perhaps it's you're doing something that you shouldn't do, and you're sorry afterwards. But you know, my friends, the essence of sin, and it's the main cause of the trouble in the world tonight, is rebellion against God. Listen. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. Now that is the essence of sin. It's not just a weakness in human nature. It is something deliberate. And this is the problem in the world tonight. It isn't merely that men and women are slack and that they're indolent and that they're easygoing. No, no. They set themselves together. There is an anti-God spirit. There is a hatred of God. They take counsel together. They're utterly opposed to him. And they want to try to get rid of him and his holy laws. Now, why do they do this? What is the cause of this enmity against God? And the answer is that they feel that God is against them. People's idea of God is of someone in the heavens who's against us, wants to rob us of all happiness and joy and peace, and is always putting us down wants to make us miserable, a tyrant that wants to subjugate us and to keep us in shackles. That's what they said, you see, then, and they're still saying it, about our Lord's holy commandments. What they said was this, let us break their bands asunder and let us cast away their cords from us. What God had given for their benefit, for their use, 
for their well-being, they regard it as dams and as cause. And this is the modern problem. People, you see, regard the Ten Commandments as something against us. Something that says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Standing between us and everything we want to do. Standing between us and enjoyment and happiness and all that we covet. They regard the Ten Commandments as inimical to us and to our highest and our best interest. And this is why the world is in its present state. They don't realize, you see, that God gave the Ten Commandments in his grace to restrain sin and evil and to keep evil within bounds. That's why he appointed magistrates and governors and all these other things. God in his grace has done this to make life possible. Without law, you have nothing but chaos and utter confusion. And you and I have got to point this out to the modern men and the modern woman who are objecting to the Ten Commandments and who want to live their free life. They shake off their upbringing, which may have been godly. They shake off reading the Bible. These things they say are against us. We want liberty, we want freedom, we want to enjoy ourselves. And these things, they say, are against us. But my dear friends, let me show you. What is your complaint against honor thy father and mother? Why is that a restriction and a prohibition? What's wrong in paying respect to those who have looked after you and cared for you and have been interested in your welfare? Thou shalt not kill. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with murder? Why do men and women want liberty to murder and to shoot? What's wrong with thou shalt not commit adultery? The people regard these as bans and as cause and as something that's set against us, that God is unfair to us. And coveting your neighbor's wife bearing false witness against your neighbor. All these things are said against us. Let's break them free. Let's get loose. Let's do what we like, what we want. But you know, my friends, our world is as it is tonight because of that attitude to God's holy commandments. If only every man and woman in the world at this moment lived according to the Ten Commandments, There'd be no more drunkenness. There'd be no more infidelity. No more promiscuity. No more immorality. No more divorce. No more little children breaking their hearts at the trouble between father and mother. No theft, no robbery, no thuggery. If only everybody lived according to God's holy law, the world would be paradise. But the world thinks this is against us. And they say, let's break them and look at their confidence. Let us, they say. They set themselves together. They think they can do it. They believe that by organizing together, they can really get rid of all this and live the life they want to live. Their fatal self-confidence. Well, now that, according to the Bible, is the only explanation as to why the world is as it is tonight. You can no longer say it's due to ignorance. We've never been so well educated. You no longer can say it's due to lack of education. We are having it. The media, the papers, the books, they're all providing us with it. No, no. There is only one explanation of the state of the world tonight. Your industrial strife. Your class warfare and all the violence we are witnessing is ultimately due to the lawlessness that emanates from rebellion against Almighty God. But the psalmist doesn't leave it even at that. He goes on then to show us the terrible folly, the madness, of setting yourselves together 
and bending yourselves together and taking counsel together against God. And you and I have got to show men and women that they're mad. They don't know it. They don't realize it. It's their ignorance of God. But this man now proceeds to tell them, you see, what they're doing. Listen. That's what they say. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. What then? Listen. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I, have I forgot, begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. What does it all mean? Well, it means this, that men and women in their madness don't realize that they're not defying men, they're not defying preachers or ministers or elders, or parents, they're defying God. Who is he? He's the one that sitteth in the heavens. He's above the flux of time. He's the great creator. And this is what we've got to tell men and women. Do you remember how one of the Psalms, our medical Psalms puts it? Behold, before Jehovah's awful throne, Ye nations bow, the great nations of the world, with their armaments and their bombs, and all their great confidence in their might. Before Jehovah's awful throne, ye nations bow with sacred joy. Know that the Lord alone is God. He can create and he destroy. God sitteth in the heavens. You remember how the early church put it in their prayer. In their terrible predicament, they turned to him and they said, Lord, thou art God, who hast made heaven and earth and the sea, and all that in them is. And our first business in this age in which we live is to tell men and women about this almighty God, the great Jehovah, the one who sits in the heavens and who laughs at petty men and women trying to withstand him. They don't believe in God. This is one of the most amazing things to me at the present time. Men and women, and this is how I can prove their madness to you. They're much too learned. They're much too scientific. So they tell us to believe in God. But you know what they do believe in? They believe in what is called the DNA molecule. This is an amazing fact about the modern man. Oh, he's much too intelligent. He's too great a brain to believe in God creating and producing man, creating man in his own image and likeness. So you go to them and you ask them, well now how do you explain the world? How do you explain the universe? Well, they'll tell you that it's all explained in this odd chemical substance, which is called the DNA molecule, which decides how protoplasm, primitive matter, is to develop and is to multiply. And they say the whole process of the development of nature to produce man is to be explained in terms of this chemical molecule, which hasn't got a mind, it can't think, it can't reason, it can't imagine, it can't plan, it can't have any logic. But they believe that. They don't believe in God, but they believe in the DNA molecule, 
If that isn't madness, what is madness? No, no, my friends. Men and women are mad and we must tell them that. They are dealing with God who has created everything, who sustains everything. He controls the ends of the earth. He can give the heathen for an inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for a possession. He is the great Jehovah, I am. I am that I am. He is the maker, creator, sustainer of all things. And there he is sitting in the heavens looking upon the folly of mankind. And he looks upon it, as we are told, with wrath. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. We've got to tell men and women about this. Do you believe still in Scotland in the wrath of God? Many in England don't believe it. They say this is a terrible idea, this God that sits on Mount Sinai condemning people. But the God of the Bible, the creator of the universe, is a God of wrath. He never made this world as it is tonight. He hates it as it is tonight. Do you remember what Paul said to the Romans? Why was he going to preach the gospel to them? Well, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Yes, but here's a further reason. He says the wrath of God is already revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men that hold down the truth in unrighteousness. And we've got to tell men that God is still there. He's still governing. He's going to judge the world in righteousness. And his wrath is upon all evil and sin and transgression and law-breaking. And he has the power. He has the power to break them with a rod of iron and to dash in pieces like a potter's vessel. And this Bible is a record of the manifestation of the power of God. He manifested it at the flood, which was so similar to this present age, with sin raging in its violence. God manifested his judgment, and that ancient world was destroyed, apart from eight souls. He did it many times to his own people when they rebelled against him. He sent them off into captivity. He gave power to their enemies. But you know, above all, he manifested it in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The clever kings and princes and counselors, they sat together, they counseled together, as the early church said in their prayer, against Christ and they decided to put him to death, feeling that if they'd done that, he'd have been got rid of and they'd have no more troubles. And they did kill him, and they buried him, and they put him in a grave, and they rolled a stone onto it and sealed it and put soldiers to guard it, and they thought they'd got a great victory. But he that sitteth in the heavens laughed. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion, God raised him from the dead, making a sport and a spoil of principalities and powers, making an open show of them in that very fact of the crucifixion and the resurrection. My dear friends, this is the one whom they're defying in their madness and in their folly, not only a holy God, but an all-powerful God. And yet, they are defying him because they are ignorant of his nature. But there is something else which is even more tragic. And that is this. The real tragedy of the world and its defiance of God is not merely that they are opposed to his laws and reject his laws what really breaks my heart is this, that they're rejecting his love. Listen, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, his Messiah, his deliverer. 
God has not merely given the Ten Commandments. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has manifested his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners and rebels, Christ died for us. And this is the thing we must point out to men and women as being the most amazing thing of all. They're not only rejecting God's holy laws and regarding them as bands and cords. They ridicule his love. They're laughing at his offer of salvation. For God is offering men and women forgiveness of their sin, even though they've been so foolish, so mad, so arrogant, so vile. God still offers them free pardon and forgiveness in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son. We are told here, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. It is possible for men and women to know this blessedness, this happiness, this peace, this being reconciled to God, having peace with God, knowing God as our Father, having access to him whenever we're in trouble in prayer, having a hope of glory which baffles description. It is possible for us to live a blessed and a happy and a joyful life in this present world. God didn't spare his only son to make this possible for us. He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. We must tell men and women this and show them that in their madness and folly they're rejecting and spurning this love of God. This is the ultimate tragedy, that they're refusing peace, happiness, joy, tranquility, conquest over the world, conquest over the fear of death and eternal bliss. Well then, the final question, and with this I close, is this. That being a delineation of the cause of the trouble, the explanation of the trouble, the exposure of the madness, and the tragedy of the world's trouble, the world is so unhappy, and it could be happy if it but believed. What are we to say to them? What is the final appeal? Well, this is this man's final appeal. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and he perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. What are we to do? Now, my friends, I'm going to speak very plainly. There are people in England, God forbid, that you should imitate them here in Scotland. There are people here, the people in England, evangelical people, I regret to say, who seem to have come to the conclusion that what the modern man needs is entertainment. They say, no, no, the modern man doesn't need preaching. And they're preaching less and less. What are they doing? They're entertaining the people. They're teaching the people to sing. This mania for singing. They're entertaining people. They have their troops. They're not only teaching them how to sing. They're teaching them how to act in dramas. How to mime the scriptures. They're teaching them how to dance. This is what they're doing. They say people today can't take preaching. They can't listen to preaching. We must give them what they can understand. So we give them singing, dancing, miming, drama, and all these things. My dear friends, in the name of God, I say, that is to do violence to the teaching of the Scripture. We are not here to entertain people. 
The world can entertain. The church is always bad at entertaining. That's why she's a fool to attempt it. We are not called to entertain. What are we here to do? We are called to, we are here to call people to be wise, to think, to be instructed. The preaching of the gospel is not simply a message which tells people to come to Christ or that Jesus loves them or that God loves them. No, no. It's an appeal to them to be wise because they're mad. They're to stop. They're to think. They're to reason. They're to be instructed. We are to teach. We are to preach to all and sundry, great and small, kings, judges, and all the people on the face of the earth. My people are dying through lack of knowledge, says Hosea, and it's true today. We are not here to be popular. We are here to tell people the naked truth and to warn them before it is too late. You notice how it is put here in a very striking manner. Having told them to be wise, to think and to be instructed, and to consider their latter end and to face the facts, we tell them to serve the Lord with fear and to rejoice not with a carefree, light and flippant attitude as we dance on our stages. No, but to rejoice with trembling. Our God is a consuming fire and we are to serve him with reverence and godly fear. That doesn't mean that we are miserable wretches. That doesn't mean that we are pompous in our solemnity. Not at all. The Apostle Paul was one of the most serious men the world has ever known. But he knew a joy that is an exception in Christians. Why are we to tell them to serve the Lord with fear and to rejoice with trembling? The answer is this. We are to urge them to kiss the Son, lest he be angry and he perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, we are to hear people to, in, we are to invite people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and to kiss him and to serve him with fear. I like this image. You've read, haven't you, how after a general election there is a new government. And what happens? Well, all the members of the new government have to go to the Queen in Buckingham Palace to take office. And what do they do? They give a kiss of allegiance. They bend before her and they kiss her hand. A sign of allegiance, sign of submission. And she gives them the authority to govern. That's what you and I have got to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. There he is, God has sent him. And there it is, this amazing offer of salvation. We're to call men and women to bow before him. To kiss the Son. Give themselves to him in allegiance and in service. Why? Lest he perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little. This to me is a terrible phrase. It's terribly true of the world tonight. Do you know what we are witnessing in our world tonight? I can tell you. We are witnessing the wrath of God the Father and the Son when it is kindled but a little. The only way I can explain the 20th century with its two world wars, with all the calamities, with all the concentration camps, the world as it is tonight, shivering on the brink of the abyss. What is this? I say this is a manifestation of the wrath of God when it is kindled but a little. It is the wrath of God, as you can read in the second half of the first chapter of the epistle to the Romans, 
there are times in the history of the world, according to the Apostle Paul, when God abandons men, men and women. He hands them over to a reprobate mind. It's a manifestation of his wrath. The wrath of God is already revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And one of the ways in which God manifests his wrath is to, restru- is to re- withdraw his restraining influences. And I believe he's doing that tonight. We in our cleverness have said we can make a world without God. And we've been confident. We've set ourselves. We've taken counsel together. We've been defying God. What is God doing? God is saying to us through present circumstances, get on with it. If you can live without me, live without me. If you can make a perfect society without me and my laws, get on with it. Do it. He's abandoning us. He's handing us over to a reprobate mind. But this is but a manifestation of the wrath of God when it is kindled but a little And we must warn people to think, to reason, to consider all this, and to be wise, because a day is coming when the wrath of God will not be manifested and revealed and kindled but a little, but all the vials of his wrath will be poured out together, and these wretched kings and princes at that day will cry unto the rocks and to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Men and women, this is what we've got to tell these perishing masses round and about us. We don't stop merely at condemning them. We are here to warn them, to plead with them, to think, to be wise, to reason, to consider, tell them about God and his holiness and his might, his wrath and his love, and plead with them to escape from the wrath to come by kissing the Son, by yielding themselves to him, by serving him with fear and rejoicing with trembling, assuring them in the meantime that blessed are all they that put their trust in him. God forbid that we should be misled by this delusion, that we are to give the people what they want, that we are to entertain people. This is our commission. Here are the instructions. This is the only way in which men can find peace, happiness, joy, tranquility, and lose the fear of death, and look with joy and anticipation to the glory that awaits us all in the heavenly Jerusalem, in our everlasting home. May God fill the members of the SEC and all ministers, preachers, and true Christians with this message and with the power of the Spirit upon it that we may save some souls under the hands of God while his wrath is kindled but a little before the day of final vengeance and judgment dawns upon us. God bless us to that great and glorious end. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.